almost all of us have gone through toll booths at one time or another in our lives. You know, we have to drive along and then stop and pay a toll, and go on to the next place, stop and pay a toll. And not so much now as, as it was in the past, but all the toll booths had, were manned by people. Nowadays, it's more electronic, and they get to scan your license tag and that sort of thing, and then send you a bill plus the, uh, the, the fees that are added on to it. But back in the time when there were people actually working in those booths, Dr. Charles Garfield told about an event that he experienced. It was late in the afternoon of 1984, and he was on his way to a meeting in San Francisco. And he said that he went toward a booth. And he said, as I, as I approached, I heard loud music. It sounded like a party. I looked around, no other cars had their windows open, no sound was coming from any trucks. I looked at the toll booth, and inside it, the man was dancing. I asked, what are you doing? And he said, I'm having a party. I looked down at, at the other toll booth and asked, well, what about the rest of the people? And he pointed down the row of booths and said, what do those look like to you? And he said, well, they look like toll booths. What do they look like to you? And the toll collector said, vertical coffins. At 8.30 every morning, live people get in. Then they die for eight hours. At 4.30, like Lazarus, rise from the dead, they reemerge and go home. For eight hours, their brain is on hold, dead on the job, going through the motions. Garfield said, I'm, I was amazed. This guy had developed a philosophy and mythology about his job. 16 people dead on the job, and the 17th, in precisely the same situation, figures out a way to live. I couldn't help asking the next question. Why is it different for you? You're having a good time. And he looked at me and said, I knew you were going to ask that. I don't understand why anybody would think my job is boring. I have a corner office, glass on all sides, I can see the Golden Gate, San Francisco, and the Berkeley Hills. Half the Western world vacations here, and I just stroll in every day and practice dancing. It's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? How we look at circumstances and, and how we react can mean the difference between merely existing or living in constant dread, or finding the entertainment factor in situations, or the good in circumstances, or the joy that is available to fill us every moment of every day. We're entering into what most people refer to as the most wonderful time of the year. Many are planning their Christmas vacations or shopping for Christmas gifts. Families join together to decorate houses and put up colored lights and Christmas balls and so forth. Many will attend Christmas parties and celebrate the season with family and friends. The entire world joins together to celebrate this special season. It's a time of joy. But what is joy? Joy is a peculiar word. The dictionary defines the word as the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. But is joy truly tied to circumstances, like the dictionary describes? Can we experience joy only as we experience well-being, success, and good fortune? The scriptures teach us that true joy can live in our hearts despite external pressures and adverse circumstances. For example, look at Mary, the mother of Jesus. Before she got married, she became pregnant. And society at that time had certain rules about this, including a possible death sentence. I mean, after all, 
Who would believe that Mary was part of a divine birth? What would Joseph think? Who would believe that she had never been physically intimate with a man? I mean, after all, she was pregnant. Mary faced numerous adverse circumstances. But what did, the, what did she experience as the news came that she would bear Jesus? She experienced joy. Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Now I'm sure she wrestled with it for a bit, but then she accepted her call in life and looked forward to what was going to unfold, knowing that God's hand was in it. Mary could have looked at all the negative aspects of her unplanned pregnancy and all that that could have brought against her, but she found joy in her circumstances. She found joy in the possibilities that lay ahead. Now going back several centuries from where Mary was, the people of Israel during uh, Isaiah's time were held in captivity. Their future seemed quite bleak, but the word of God came and said uh, through the prophet Isaiah and assured the people that relief was going to come. When God freed the people and sent his Messiah, joy would fill the earth. Even nature would rejoice and be glad. God said through Isaiah, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The dry land was going to be quenched. Life was going to be restored. And that was something great to look forward to. The people were called to strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. The call is to get ready. God is doing marvelous things. Don't wallow in self-pity. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by what seems to be an endless despair. Look for what God is doing and what God is going to do. Look with hope and anticipation for a better future because when you believe in God and believe in what God is willing, able, and going to do, life changes for the better. Isaiah said, the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. Life is more abundant when we recognize the promise of God, when we accept God to be good to his word. And true, life does happen, and we sometimes face challenges that can feel overwhelming. And those challenges can cause a whole range of, of debilitating emotions. But if we choose to trust God, if we choose to find the positive aspect of what is challenging us, if we choose to find God's presence and help, we can move forward with a much better and deeper confidence and conviction that all will work out for the best. Now, I know that we're all trained to do our own thing, to figure out our own solutions, to not inconvenience others by asking for help. We're brainwashed into believing that we're the masters of our own destinies, and to look for or ask for help isn't a very good option because it gives us the appearance of being weak. And yet the Bible encourages us in so many ways to ask God for help. We're not independent contractors who have to do everything ourselves. 
were designed to rely on God, but are convinced that we are to do otherwise. Now, if we're not supposed to rely on God for anything, why would God have come to us in Jesus Christ? Why would we be celebrating the birth of our Lord? Why would we have this annual reminder of the greatest expression of love ever displayed? God fulfilled his promise to the Jewish people and to the world by sending the Messiah. <clears throat> Those who recognized the baby and they rejoiced in the fulfillment of that promise. Those who encountered him later in life had their lives changed. The hardships were less hard. Their hearts and their outlook brightened. The blind were able to see. The deaf able to hear. The lame were, were able to leap for joy. And that promise, that opportunity of great joy, is still there. And it's ready for our acceptance. All it takes is a small but very challenging step. And that step is the willingness to recognize the promise of God and to grab hold of it. This means surrendering our self-appointed stubbornness. It means willingly letting go of our need to do everything ourselves. It means being open to not having all the answers and allowing God's guidance and direction to flow in us and through us. And that's hard to do. It's hard to give up that sense of control. It's hard to give up our need to do things our own way. It's hard to rely on a source other than ourselves to know what is best to do. God knew what the people of history needed. They needed him. They needed to trust him. They needed to rely on him. And we need the same thing. We need God. And in him, we will find true joy in our lives. Remember the dictionary defines joy as the emotion evoked by well-being, success, or good fortune. And we need to set that definition aside and live for the biblical definition of joy. Biblical joy isn't bound in external circumstances. Mary's joy wasn't tied to the hardship she was going to face. It did, she wasn't tied to everyone in Nazareth being excited about her giving birth. Her joy wasn't tied to external circumstances. Her joy was found in doing as God had chosen and called her to do. And ours will be the same. When we attach our joy to God and his desires for us, when we know that we're moving in the right direction, we will find joy. And this is how Mary lived her life. She attached her joy to God's work. This is how the disciples of Jesus worked long after Jesus rose from the dead. They did as they were called and experienced true joy in life. And as they lived in expectancy of God's activity, they experienced joy. And as we attach ourselves to the Lord's actions in our lives, we will experience a deep and unshakable joy. Now, if you need a little bit of a nudge in how to get started in finding joy in your life, there's a few things that can be done to help you do that. And believe it or not, there are ways of living and looking at life through the eyes of a dog. Now, there's a whole bunch of lessons, but I'm just going to share a couple with you. Here they are. Run, romp, and play daily. On hot days, drink lots of water and lay in the shade of a nice tree. Delight in the simple joy of a long walk. 
When you're happy, dance around and wag your entire body. your face. Avoid biting when a simple growl. This will be a beginning to open your heart and mind to the greater joy. To take less seriously some perspectives on life and replace them with something simpler will definitely work wonders. God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to the world so that we might experience connection with God and find joy on earth. This is the season of joy, and we can look forward to what's happening, look beyond our circumstances, and experience true joy in life, the kind of joy that lies beyond external circumstances and is tied to the Lord and his presence in our lives and how he's walking with us every step of the way. So as Christmas approaches, find the joy in what you're doing. Make life simple. And remember, don't bite when a simple growl will do. Soli Deo Gloria, to God alone be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word given to us. Grant us the wisdom and insight to write your word upon our hearts and the courage to live it. In Jesus' name, amen.